So to the news, I have this is a really exciting story from NBCnews.com. Facebook names 20 people to its Supreme Court for content moderation. The list includes nine law professors, a Nobel Peace Prize laureate from Yemen, and journalists, but no disinformation experts from David Ingram. Now, I'm sharing this because I'm excited. This is good news. This is this is like if Facebook is here, like it's sort of like if you're going to be subject to, you know, a uh, mafia boss dominating your neighborhood and charging everybody protection racket fees, then, it, you know, let, let, at least it'd be nice if he you know doesn't beat his wife. Right. So no, I'm not I'm not endorsing Facebook with this by any stretch of the imagination, but I am willing to point out positive developments. And when Facebook is doing the right thing, whether it's by choice or because they're forced to or, you know, that the, they, they are, are backed into a corner about something. Sure. And ABC or sorry, NBC News here. I wonder, no disinformation experts. This is a sort of media elitist mentality do you you know and i get it there should be disinformation experts involved in in the, the, this whole process identifying disinformation campaigns but th that that's not really where this is going and, and not the part that i want to focus on you know does nbc feel like it's competing with facebook oh yeah certainly facebook on wednesday appointed 20 people from around the world to serve on what will effectively be the social media network's supreme court for speech issuing rulings on what kind of posts will be allowed and what should be taken down. Now, there's an inclination, Adam, this is a corporation supported by government, and now we have global content moderation. This could be terrible. They're going to send, you know, and actually, there is uh, there's someone, there's a libertarian from the Cato Institute on this. And I, I think this is really a positive development. Now, uh, of course, having more decentralization, having less of a need for this is, is going to be the greater phase of progress of the Internet towards a, a blockchain based decentralized system. But for the people who want this and even perhaps in a decentralized system, as opposed to the, the centralized corporatist social media system that we have today, there may be people who want to not have to think about it. They want, you know, they want an authority. If it's a, if it's something you sign up for voluntarily, I, I can't say I have a problem with it. Now, you see, I know people, you know, might be new here uh, to this conversation are going, but Adam, you know, Facebook is a private entity. Can't they do whatever they want in your book? Uh, yes and no. Of course, they have to adhere to the non-aggression principle. And what's really problematic, oh my gosh, now I sound like a social justice warrior on this. Now, the real problem with, Facebook is that it is a corporation that is not a product of the free market. It is a it is a corporation that is a product of huge government intervention in the market of corporatism, of socialism, of even Trump's new fascism, authoritarianism, because Facebook benefits from government policies in ways that keep them protected from competition, which you would have if there was an actual market for social media. We don't actually have that right now. What we have is a government-sponsored oligopoly in social media. And it's a symbiotic relationship where government gets to control the narrative and the social media giants get to hold on to their privileged economic positions. And one of the things that's not really considered in this, and, and of course there's all the normal corporatism uh, of uh, policies that make it harder for startups to compete with established businesses through regulations and, and imposed overhead costs, but really underpinning this now, intellectual property. The fact that government says you can use the violence of government to impede the free flow of information because someone claimed it first. Absolute nonsense. And this is not an easy issue for a lot of people to wrap their heads around, even though you know I grew up with Napster and LimeWire and now it's the Pirate Bay where you can get whatever you want, uh, you know, torrented for free. They can't stop it. The Internet is killing this this government racket known as intellectual property anyway. But if you want the two page summary, again, I would direct you to thefreedomline.com and go get freedom for free there. And the section on intellectual property is uh, just another short section, just two pages, really easy way to get a sense of the intellectual property issue from a libertarian perspective. But if it wasn't for this intellectual property racket, 
we would already be at some version of open source social media as opposed to this. So maybe Facebook will transition to uh, this new era. Maybe they'll do it by being forced in, in sort of this trailing way to uh, get in line with the, the demands of the market and really listen to the needs of consumers in terms of what they want for social media as opposed to what can we get them hooked on. And yes, Facebook is disastrous for people psychologically who spend too much time on it, increasing depression, anxiety, uh, a whole host of other uh, mental issues that, that go along with this. So um, the list, again, back to this, includes nine law professors, a Nobel Peace Prize laureate from Yemen, journalists, free speech advocates, and a writer from the Libertarian Cato Institute. Now. I have uh, a lot of respect for what Cato has done. A lot of people uh, within there doing great work, but it is not really the gold standard of libertarianism. It, 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 it might, this might be a false nod to freedom, but if you, if you look at what they're doing, and again, I'm not saying this is perfect. This is happening in, in a very imperfect world. And I'm not saying, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Because uh, there's a better good coming with blockchain-based decentralized social media. We are always looking to push that. We got involved with Steemit for a while before realizing that there were a lot of problems with that. It wasn't really the future of decentralized social media so much as a pump and dump scam. Um, we're going to be looking at EOS. Um, I, I wonder where I haven't checked in with Dan Larimer in a while. Uh, be interesting to see what the status of that is. I know he's behind schedule, but genius, uh, incredible mind with Dan Larimer working on great things. There are a lot of programmers, coders in the crypto community working on the whole new, better world of social media. Absent, however, was any prominent expert in studying disinformation. Facebook has struggled to contain state-based manipulation efforts as well as hoaxes on subjects like false cures and gun violence. Is social media the cure for this? You know, I wonder if you had at this point already some kind of private decentralized social media system, blockchain based or not, you'd have a way to keep government off of it, right? Can we, can we just declare this a government free zone? It will at least make them infiltrate work a little harder rather than like the troll farms that we have set up in uh, that, that we've seen already exposed in Russia that we know are happening with American government intel agencies as well. Um, we've seen the, there was a, uh, what was it, a request for software from the Pentagon to be able to have sock puppet accounts on social media. Now, I'm not for force tracking of any kind, but I might in that world be more inclined to a form of social media where you do have to verify your identity to sign on. Maybe it's called the thumbprint network, you know? So, you know, did, I, I, I would. I'm not trying to be anonymous. There's some. I want the right in, to to be anonymous, but I choose not to be. If if you could be guaranteed that it was secure, you know, because you knew that everyone else on there had verified their identity. So right. Well, that's the point. Is that is that if if and and this is just the first thing off the top of my head. Even my dumbass is like, yeah, hey, here's. I'm not a programmer. I'm not a designer of social media systems. But here's one thing that I as a consumer would want that that I want to, to be able to get together with other consumers to say, yeah, we, we should have this in social media. If there was a network where like, you know, you, you just you're, you had to verify your thumbprint in order to log on somehow. And we knew then that the conversation in that space was one where everybody was directly accountable for all their words and there was no manipulation and no censorship or at least, you know, no. Yeah, yeah, really, no censorship. Maybe you see again the whole sense, like this whole thing uh, about Facebook. Man, back to the main story here. That uh, content moderation, it, it really is kind of a bullshit premise in the first place. The way that it's being done now, posts being taken down, as opposed to having, uh, you know, shades pulled over them. Right? They, like if, if you post something that that's um, say racist, you're my neighbor. What happens is some one of one of your friends from you know the other side of the country flags it for being racist, Facebook takes it down, and now I'm denied the ability to know that my neighbor is racist, that you just moved in, and I wanna check out my neighbor, who is this guy? Oh, he's gotta post it, but it's, and it's, on his, but it's got a film over, it's got a shade over it, I'm gonna click, it says, warning, racist content. Oh, my neighbor got a warning. Now I'm not gonna take this warning as you know reason to condemn him entirely, 
uh, I'm comfortable looking at racist content, especially when I have a reason to, to, to investigate my neighbor. I'm going to click reveal. It's going to show me what Jim's thoughts really are here. And I want to know. I want racism to be dealt with, to be treated. And the other thing is self-harm. The way they, they have censored self-harm posts. Um, and, and this especially goes to, to, uh, to teenagers, young girls especially, uh, slitting their wrists, doing cutting, other forms of self-mutilation. These are cries for help. And the cries for help are being censored off of social media, clearly doing more harm than good. So the oversight board is more than two years in the making, creation prompted by Zuckerberg, who said in 2018, he wanted to create some sort of structure like a Supreme Court for a uh, final judgment call on what is acceptable speech and relieve the company's executives of having to decide. So instead of being like, you know, this could be a member, like they could hold election, right? And that would be that would be a better step, right? To actually hold elections among everybody who's on Facebook. Say these are going to be your moderators and the, the, it's the people who decide. But no, they're not they're not going that far. But what I, what I really want to underscore as the positive thing that this represents is it is an example of what I have been talking about for years, that as the internet develops, we will have better mechanisms of governance, of communal decision-making, of resource distribution uh, solutions that are going to render government obsolete. Why do we need an FEC, uh, for FC, a federal, FCC, Federal Communications Commission. Why, why do we need the government regulating speech on the internet when well, Facebook can do it? And it might not be perfect, but I guarantee you, because it's a voluntary system that you can still opt out of, it is going to be better than any government one.